Ah, yes. Purple Emperor butterflies are perhaps one of the most beautiful and sought after insects in Europe. But what makes these insects so special? I'm going to explain this to you in this episode of Drawer of the Week. And before we start, I wanted to say that this episode is a little homage to Mr. Mark Yules from the United Kingdom, someone who I consider to be a friend and a mentor. Mark, if you're watching this, I will never forget your hospitality to me. And much of the information in this video are things that I have learned from you. I hope that you and everybody else watching this channel will enjoy it. Let's begin the episode. Thanks for watching. Emperor butterflies are famous for their beautiful, shiny, purple iridescence. However, when making this video I had a problem. My camera appeared to be almost blind to the reflection of the wings of these emperor butterflies. And no matter what I did, I wasn't able to film the shiny purple effect of the, of the wings very well. So in what is so far one of my most difficult to make episodes of Drawer of the Week, I had to become a little bit more creative. So I had an idea. I devised a setup containing of four spotlights pointing towards the butterfly from all directions. I believe that surely a higher degree of illumination would make the iridescence of this butterfly more strongly visible on camera. For I thought that the ambient lighting was not enough to pick up for my camera. So after flaring up all four lights and putting the specimen in the middle, the result was disappointing. The purple was not really visible. Turns out that light coming from all directions is actually counterproductive. These butterflies reflect light only in a very specific angle. And if you shine light from them from all directions, this effect is nullified. So I turned off three of the four lights and pointed only one of them towards the butterfly in a certain angle. Under a singular light, suddenly the iridescence finally became visible. And we could start the episode. What we see here is Apatura Iris. Right here, in the top of this frame, we see a male specimen showing the iridescence in the wings. Below, the bigger specimen, but without color, is the female. One may notice that females of this species actually don't have the shiny iridescence on their wings at all, and are a bit more boring looking. The male, however, is spectacular. The purple emperor, Apatura iris, is a species that is distributed throughout most parts of Central Europe. Next to that, it is also found in the temperate parts of Asia, including but not limited to China, Korea, Japan and parts of Russia. The purple emperor is a true woodland species and is only found in old dediquous broadleaf forests. In particular, it has a preference for the types of forests that are dominated by older oak trees. This is for it decides to spend most of its life on the canopy and rather rarely comes down to ground level. Butterflies can only drink their food in liquid form and are really fond of sugary fluids. Most people 
will form the mental connection between butterflies and flowers. Flowers which they like to visit in order to get some sweet, sugary nectar in exchange. However, if you are a woodland species, flowers aren't particularly abundant. Especially if you are a butterfly that spends most of his life in the treetops, like the purple emperor does. Coincidentally, this reflects on the biology and behavior of the butterfly. Purple emperors are one of the butterflies that actually never visit flowers. Instead, they have a few alternative food sources. Just like any other butterfly, the purple emperor is really fond of sweet, sugary substances. It just gets them in alternative ways. There are a few examples of things these butterflies are attracted to. One example of a very sweet and sugary liquid that can be found in forests is tree sap. Now, it does depend on the species of tree that you're looking for, but in particular, for example, the sap of oak trees contains a lot of sugar. There is one problem though, this sap is usually deeply contained within the tree. However, in a forest full of trees, it is not that uncommon that a tree gets severely damaged. This could be by an animal, by a human or natural causes like a storm. And when that happens, there is a chance that the tree will start heavily bleeding. Now this tree sap will attract the purple emperor who will readily suck up its sugary liquid. Tree sap is not the only source of sugar in a forest. Naturally, many fruits, especially in late summer, will fall from the trees and to the ground and start rotting. This starts a fermentation process in which sugar is converted into alcohol. The smell of sugar and alcohol attracts these butterflies strongly, for it means there are some nice sugary fruits, perhaps rotting on the ground, their juices flowing out. And these butterflies in forests can also be seen sucking the juices from several types of fruits that have fallen to the ground. Another source of sugar found in the forest is honeydew. Honeydew is the sugary secretion produced by aphids, sap-sucking insects that are found on certain types of trees and plants. Currently in this video you are looking at a male specimen of Apatura iris. And what is most notable about him is the strong, shiny, purple sheen on his wings. His wings seem to reflect light, a process known as iridescence. Basically the wings of this male reflect bluish purple light. Now this has a function because this light is highly attractive to the female. The females of the purple emperor are quite sensitive to the particular kind of light that the wings of the males reflect. And it is basically a mode of communication, for females are attracted to it. This mode of communication may have several advantages for the butterflies. First of all, it is very easy for the females to spot a partner from a great distance. If you are looking for a tiny butterfly hidden somewhere in the canopy of a great forest, then a light signal may actually be highly noticeable. Light carries far away and is instantly noticeable. So basically it helps females easily spot males. Second of all, it may also be a cue for his fitness. For the strongest and healthiest males will have the highest degree of iridescence, whereas older and worn out males or weak males will perhaps have a reduced iridescent effect on their wings, thus allowing the females not only to spot a partner easily against the background, but also interpret his, interpret his fitness and suitability as a mate. The males of this species are much more commonly found than the females. 
But this is not because males are more common than females. The main difference is because of its behavior. Females are rare and elusive because they tend to spend their entire lives in the treetops and rarely come down. Males, however, are known to descend to the ground level in some cases. This is because there is a difference in their behavior and their needs to survive. And contrary to the females, the males have to produce sperm and also pheromone, which is a chemical that smells attractive to the female. In order to produce sperm, the males need to seek out amino acids and minerals that the female does not require in her diet. And thus, males are known in some occasions to descend to ground level to suck up mineral rich fluids. In order to find these precious minerals, males will be attracted to different kinds of bait that females ignore. One of them are mud puddles. Commonly, puddles of rainwater in the, on the forest floor will absorb minerals from the soil which the males can drink. But they are also attracted to rotting animal carcasses and even poo. It is not uncommon to see males on animal dung because this is also very rich in salt and minerals. And so are animal carcasses and any type of mineral rich fluids found on the forest floor. And now you're looking at the female. The females are bigger than the males and they are colorless for they lack the blue shiny iridescence that the males have. They spend most of their life in the treetops and are thus a little bit elusive. Their main function is trying to find a partner and laying eggs on the appropriate host plant. The host plant of this butterfly are some kinds of willow. Types of willow they lay their eggs on are those with broad leaves related to sallow, also known as goat willow or pussy willow, scientific name Salix capraea, and similar species to those. In Europe, there is more than just one species of purple emperor. Now we are looking at Apatura ilia, the lesser purple emperor. As the name implies, this species is a little bit smaller than the greater purple emperor that we just showed you. Otherwise, however, their ecology is almost the same. The main difference between these two species is that Apatura ilia prefers to lay eggs on aspen, scientific name Populus, also known as poplar tree. Interestingly, both the greater purple emperor and the lesser purple emperor can both use willow and poplar tree as their host plants. However, the lesser purple emperor will have a preference for poplar tree and lay eggs on willow less frequently and the greater purple emperor will have a preference for willow and lay eggs on poplar tree less frequently. And thus there is an ecological distinction. The lesser purple emperor can also be more abundant than the greater purple emperor seemingly having a higher population density and occurring in higher numbers in some cases. Most interesting about this species are the females that seem to vary a lot. They vary much more than the greater purple emperor and different color forms can be distinguished. In the collection I found several degrees of lighter to darker forms and even one completely orange specimen. Last but not least, there is a third species of purple emperor that can be found in Europe. It is known as Freyer's purple emperor or also the Eastern purple emperor, scientific name Apatura metis. What sets Apatura metis apart from the two other species I've just shown? One of these things is its geographic distribution. Apatura metis is more heavily concentrated in Asia and the East. Although it is also found in Europe, it is absent in Central Europe, although there are populations in the Balkan and Southeast Europe in countries like Hungary, Croatia and Albania, but also uh, parts of Romania, Bulgaria and even a small part of Greece. Otherwise it is also found in Japan, 
Korea, China and many other great parts of Asia, the Caucasus and parts of Russia. Its ecology is similar to the two other species that have been shown before. Although Apatura matis inhabits softwood forests and riversides and lakes, while the other two species are somewhat more inclined to live in dediquous old forests. And now some eye candy. Interestingly, not all the Apaturinae and their relatives are iridescent. How about this Sevisa digroa, which uses several types of oak tree, Quercus, as its host plant, a distant relative to the purple emperors, yet lacking any form of iridescence. Or how about this Euapatura mirza, collected in Turkey, but also found in the Middle East up to countries like Iran. Its host plant is Celtis glabata from the Ulmacea family. Or how about this Mimatima schrenki, which lays its eggs on Ulmus davinia, Carpus cordata and Ulmus lactiniata, another distant relative of the purple emperor found in Korea, China and Russia. And although it has nothing to do with this episode, the last three species were just some additional eye candy. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out the links in the description and the comments. And last but not least, I was considering doing a documentary of this butterfly in the wild, but how I'm gonna do it I'm not so sure. It's very difficult to gather uh, videos of the caterpillars and adults which are quite rare where I live. Um, but maybe that's a nice project for someday in the future when my channel is bigger than it currently is and my budget bigger, but um, it's something nice to keep in mind for later. Hope you enjoy it. See you next episode. Hello everyone and thank you for watching this week's episode of Drawer of the Week. My name is Bart Coppens and I work with butterflies and moths. Both dead ones and live ones. Because I breed them in captivity. I study them, I film them, I photograph them, I research them and I volunteer in a museum collection where I'm a conservator of the butterflies and moths. Now Drawer of the Week is my weekly series where I show you one drawer with interesting specimens from a museum and give you some interesting facts about them. If you like it, like my video, subscribe to my channel and consider joining my crowdfunding platform Patreon. Because only with your help, my mission to educate the whole world about insects can be fulfilled. Thanks for watching and hopefully see you next episode of this weekly series. Hello everyone and thank you for watching my Drawer of the Week mini-series. I would like to take a moment to say thanks to the Natural History Museum of Rotterdam or in Dutch Het Natuurhistorisch Museum van Rotterdam. All the insect videos I film, I film in the scientific collection of the Rotterdam Natural History Museum where I work as a honorary junior conservator. Thanks for watching and till next time.